In this video, I will explain this Half-Life Iceberg, created by Reddit user Sockman1. I'd also like to thank Reddit user Sunshiny, who created the list of everything comment that provided basically the foundation of this video, and YouTube channel Town Cactus for creating the original Half-Life Iceberg video. On the bottom left, there will be a health meter that represents my confidence in my explanation. 100 HP means I have my fullest confidence, while one point means I probably don't know what I'm talking about. Now, I'm going to assume that you know most of the Half-Life storyline, but just to be clear, spoilers for the entire Half-Life series, including Half-Life Alex and a little bit of Portal 1. With everything out of the way, let's begin. The Black Mesa and Aperture Rivalry Half-Life and Portal are known to share the same universe, with the two respective research corporations, Black Mesa and Aperture Science, being harsh adversaries against each other. During the escape sequence in Portal 1, the player can come across one of the observation offices with a window that displays the dollars and cents slideshow. This slideshow details how Aperture Science gets treated unfairly by the US General Services Administration. Aperture proposed for more funding than Black Mesa, but would receive less than what Black Mesa got in turn. These slides represent how competitive the two were at acquiring government funding. Another example of the pair's competitiveness is the Borealis, a ship Aperture worked on that housed a project that involved powerful portals and teleportation. They rushed the project and neglected safety rules to beat Black Mesa and government funding, which resulted in the ship suddenly disappearing. Playground Screams at the beginning of Half-Life 2, the player will stumble upon a small abandoned playground. If the player interacts with the playground, sounds of children's laughter and screaming can be heard. These screams serve as an eerie reminder of the absent children due to the combine suppression field. The Consoling Couple while going through a civilian sector in Half-Life 2, the player can encounter a couple where a man is consoling a woman as she expresses her concerns about the Combine invasion and the grim future of humanity. The couple can be seen again in Episode 1, inside one of the Resistance outposts, kitted with rebel outfits. The player can overhear the conversation as they joke about Isaac Kleiner, Odessa Kovich, the Resistance, and their situation in general. In Episode 2, Two skeletons sitting on a couch can be found in the Outlands, implying that the couple had been killed and left behind. This is only a joke from the devs, as the couple can be seen again at White Forest near the end of the game. The G-Man's Briefcase The briefcase's interior is fully textured in Half-Life 1, where a pistol, paperwork, pencils, some sort of computer, and his ID, or passport, My passport? are shown. This point could also refer to Half-Life Alex's ending when the G-Man gave his briefcase to Alex, resulting in the two of them time traveling to Episode 2's ending with Eli's death. Black Mesa visiting Zen When Freeman starts to go through Zen, it becomes obvious that Black Mesa had visited the border world before. Dead scientists with HEV suits are scattered around the landscape, with health and ammo near them. These dead scientists are the survey teams, who made secret expeditions to collect data from Zen through the teleporter in the top secret Lambda complex. The Half-Life 2 Beta Leak Around September 2003, Half-Life 2's early source code was leaked after someone cracked into Valve's internal network. Valve CEO Gabe Newell posted online to explain how he realized that Valve servers had been compromised and asked the public for assistance in finding the culprit. In June 2004, Valve announced that they had found the person responsible for leaking the game. The game had been leaked by German hacker Axel Jembe, who admitted to Newell through email. This hatched a plan where Valve would invite him to a job interview, and the FBI would arrest him upon his arrival. The German government caught wind of the situation, and arrested Jembe themselves in November 2006. He was put on trial for the beta leak and other crimes such as the creation of his Trojan virus, a GoBot. Jembe was sentenced to two years probation. Valve never took any action against websites or people that had hosted the leaked content. They tolerated the use of the beta material as long as they were used in free products. The beta showcased plenty of cut maps, enemies, and weapons. City 17's art style looked more like a bleak Washington DC rather than the familiar Eastern European style we know today. 
The storyline was much darker with the combine draining oceans, filling the air with noxious gas, and utilizing child labor, a topic that will be discussed further soon. Epistle 3 Around 2017, Half-Life series writer and former Valve employee Mark Laidlaw uploaded on his blog a post titled Epistle 3, which takes form of a letter given to the player. Most of the Half-Life characters had their names replaced, such as Gordon Freeman now named Gertrude Fremont, and the G-Man being called Mrs. X. So the story goes, After the funeral of Eli Vance, Alex and Freeman journey out to the Arctic to explore the coordinates that Judith Mossman sent out to White Forest. As they reach their destination, it turns out that the coordinates are the location of the Borealis, where the Combine have already begun their research on the ship. Freeman and Alex then get captured and are presented to Dr. Breen, who had his consciousness implanted into a grub. Breen is fearful of Gordon, as he remembers how he originally died and begs to be mercy killed. It's up to the player to choose whether or not to end Breen's suffering. The two then rescue Mossman from a Combine prison causing a tense situation between Alex and Mossman as Alex believes Mossman is responsible for her father's death. They then board the Borealis, which continues to shift through time and space. They catch glimpses of the Seven Hour War along with traveling to distant alien worlds. Mossman and Alex continue to argue over what to do with the Borealis. Mossman believes that the ship should be delivered to the Resistance and be used against the Combine, a position similar to Dr. Kleiner's in Episode 2. Alex wants to destroy the ship to fulfill her father's dying wishes. She then kills Mossman and arms the Borealis to self-destruct, intending to destroy the Combine's command center. All of a sudden, the G-Man appears. Alex recognizes him from her childhood, and the two depart reality together, leaving Freeman behind. He begins to realize that the ship's self-destruction would do little in destroying the Combine Empire, and begins to accept the Resistance futility. Then. The Vortigaunts appeared and rescued him from imminent death by teleporting him back to Earth. Because Laidlaw wrote Epistle 3 after he had left Valve, the post had been the subject of intense discussion whether or not it's canon to the Half-Life storyline. At the time, the story was a solid plot synopsis of the mystical Episode 3. Now, Epistle 3's continuity with the series is… non-canon, since Half-Life Alex's ending retconned Episode 2's ending with Eli being resurrected and Alex being captured by the G-Man. Dr. Breen is a good guy. There has been a lot of discussion within the Half-Life community about whether or not Dr. Breen is the savior of humanity. He did negotiate with the Combine so humanity got a somewhat better fate than what the Combine could have originally done, which was making the humans extinct. It could also be argued that he desperately tried to capture Freeman in Half-Life 2 to use him as a trump card in negotiations with the Combine. Maybe Freeman's surrendering could have provided humanity with more freedom. However, the conditions that the people live with are still pretty terrible, with them being heavily modified as soldiers, brutally mutilated into stalkers, forcefully ruled under their fear, disgustingly fed quote unquote food products, etc. The All-Knowing Vortigaunt Near the end of the Half-Life 2 chapter Water Hazard, the player destroys a hunter chopper and opens a sliding metal gate. After going through the gate, there's a drainage tunnel along the left side that the player can enter. After traversing through a river of toxic sludge, the tunnel opens up into a large cavern where the player meets an all-knowing Vortigaunt in front of a fire while reciting chants and coughing. Each time the player presses the interact key on the Vortigaunt, he remarks cryptic statements that can refer to the Black Mesa incident, Zen, the G-Man, the Nihilanth, and Gordon's deep connection with the Vortigaunts, among other topics. He could say every single line of dialogue that a Vortigaunt can say in Half-Life 2 if prompted enough. Some people speculate that the all-knowing Vortigaunt breaks the fourth wall by alluding to the player controlling Freeman with the lines Far distant eyes look out through your Something secret steers us both We shall not name it The G-Man nuked Black Mesa During the opposing force chapter, The Package, a Black Ops team was sent to Black Mesa to arm a Mark IV thermonuclear device in the underground parking structure of the Ordnance Storage Facility. Adrian Shepard needs to take out the Black Ops team and deactivate the nuke to prevent his imminent death. Afterwards, he enters a nearby room with a view of the nuke and witnesses the G-Man reactivating it. He cannot return to the nuke, sealing the fate of the research facility. During the ending, the bomb explodes when Shepard is detained by the G-Man aboard the helicopter as a white flash covers the screen. 
zombies are conscious. In the Half-Life lore, it has been implied that humans who become headcrab zombies may be able to stay alive and retain their consciousness. The groaning that standard zombies constantly make in Half-Life 2 can be heard as the victim's muffled screams for help. This could indicate that a victim is still alive and somewhat aware of their surroundings. Ripping a head crab off of a victim shows a terrified look and a violent scream frozen onto their face. One of the most infamous examples would be the reverse zombie sound effect. When this zombie moan is reversed, the sound effect becomes a creepy plea for help. That was only the surface, and now we enter the waters. Child labor in the Half-Life 2 beta. As previously mentioned in the Half-Life 2 beta leak, the game originally had children present in the world before they were written off of the suppression field. Child workers would be tasked with manufacturing cremator heads, the head of a cut enemy that would remove corpses from the streets by incinerating them. A single Metro Cop would be responsible for supervising the factory. The player could not directly interact with the children, only seeing them work from afar either on the street or on a catwalk. The Radio Song In the Half-Life 2 chapter, Anti-Citizen 1, a television screen can be found in the closet playing a distorted song accompanied by an image of the G-Man. The same song is also heard on the radio at the beginning of Half-Life Alex. If the song is played backwards, a woman can be slightly heard saying, This discovery implies that the song is a poorly broadcasted message meant for either Freeman or the G-Man. What the woman's message would be is a mystery. Fun fact, the song uses two samples from the sample library Cuckoo Land, Ghost in the Machine. The first sample is called Distorted Trumpets, and the second sample is called Is That the Door with a Raised Free TVs. Get Your Free TVs was the first Half-Life 2 test level to be created when Valve only had a small portion of the game developed. It consisted of a test sequence designed to highlight all the new technology from the Source engine, along with testing the NPCs and physics. The level depict a street war between rioting citizens and the Metro Cops sent down to control the situation. APCs and tanks were rolling down the streets. Citizens would throw Molotov cocktails at the vehicles to make them explode. Other citizens would start looting stores and yell, Get your free TVs! Hand-to-hand -hand combat was presented with the civilians and the Metro Cops fighting each other. Brain Grub Brain Grub is a Twitter account created by series writer Mark Laidlaw where he assumes the role of Dr. Breen, sending out messages from two host bodies at different locations. The purpose of Breen's messages is to reveal any information about the Combine advisors so the Resistance could use it to defeat the Combine. Fans have taken the tweets as hints or insights about the future of the Half-Life series. Its last post would be on July 6, 2014, where it appears that the Combine hijacked and ended Breen's broadcasts. Laidlaw has specified that Breen Grub was not canon to the Half-Life storyline, and that these tweets were just something he did for fun. The G-Man is an advisor. Okay, bear with me on this. There's this theory that the G-Man is the Combine advisor which I mostly derived from this reddit post, so, uh, thank you, deleted. Freeman's final objective in Half-Life 1 was to kill the Nihilinth, which freed the Vortigaunts and made them join the Resistance in Half-Life 2. Eli Vance, one of the leaders of the Resistance, is aware of the G-Man and his capabilities. This in turn means that the Resistance represents the G-Man's operations on Earth. So, the G-Man could have the Vortigaunts under his indirect command through the Resistance, 
He could have easily ignored the Vortigaunts and left Zen creatures to fight against the Combine alone, but he was interested in the Vortigaunts, quite possibly about their Vortessence, the massive psychic energy that the Vortigaunts share. If the G-Man could gain control of the Vortigaunts, he could control one of the most powerful forces in the Half-Life universe. In Episode 1, the Vortigaunts may have caught on to the G-Man's plan, and they try to stop him from doing anything to Freeman or the Vortessence. Now the question is, why is the G-Man against the Combine? He seems to possess powerful psychic abilities and can appear to his will. His human figure could just be a psychic projection from his real form. Nothing would fit this description better than a Combine Advisor, or Shiluathoi. Sorry for the bad pronunciation. According to the Breen Grub Twitter, the advisors were forcibly enslaved by the Combine through virus-like thoughts. Somehow the G-Man circumvented this and returned to exact his revenge against the Combine. By destroying the Combine and freeing the rest of the advisors, the G-Man would be seen as a hero among them. If the G-Man and the other advisors could combine the Vortessence and their psychic powers, they could be the most powerful force in the multiverse effectively creating a brand new Shalua Thoi empire. Russell was Laszlo. Laszlo was a character that was briefly shown in the Half-Life 2 chapter, Sand Traps, where he was killed by antlions after he disturbed the sand, or if the player walked onto the sand. The character accompanying him said that he was the finest mind of his generation to come to such an end. During the reveal trailer of Half-Life Alex, this shot of the character was briefly shown. This has caused speculation that this character was Laszlo, especially after Half-Life Alex was revealed to be a prequel to Half-Life 2. The character is now known as Russell, who assists Alex on her journey to rescue her father and reach the vault. He was Laszlo during the early development of Half-Life Alex, but the developers decided that he should be an original character. The final game does include some references to Russell's old identity. In Russell's lab, a notepad with the password Laszlo, with the O as a zero, can be found near a computer. Russell is still called Laszlo in the game files. Chum Toads Chum Toads are a cut NPC that resemble a small purple creature resembling a toad. They make an appearance in Half-Life Opposing Force in Blue Shift. The Chum Toads original role in Half-Life was to be the bait that the player can use to lure or distract aliens. This bait idea was reused in Half-Life 2 as the Pharaoh Pod to summon antlion allies. Gordon's Child at the beginning of Half-Life 1, the player can open Freeman's locker which contains his diploma, some books, and a photo of a baby. According to Valve designer and artist Harry Teasley, the baby in the photo is his daughter Isabel. Series writer Mark Laylaw offered the idea that this could be an infant relative of Gordon's, such as a niece or nephew, rather than Freeman's child. Mark Laidlaw's VA Placeholder In the early development of Half-Life 1, series writer Mark Laylaw had most of the dialogue voiced as a placeholder before the voice actors recorded their lines. This can be seen in the E3 1998 demonstration of Half-Life 1, where the scientist and the security guard are voiced by Laidlaw. Here are some comparisons between the final voice lines and the voice lines that Laidlaw provided. Let's get the hell out of here. Let's get the hell out of here. Okay, I better wait here and help anyone else who comes by. Okay, I'll wait here and help anyone else who comes by. If I were a braver man, I would run for the surface. But uh, I'm afraid if the world finds out what we were doing here, Gordon. Well, please, just don't make me come with you. I'm not so sure I want to go to the surface. What if the world finds out what we were doing down here? Cheeple. Cheeple is the low-resolution citizen model used when citizens are seen from afar. Each time he is seen, the model is walking from one point to another, respawning each time in a loop. He appears in the computer screens at Kleiner's lab, where the G-Men can be seen, and at Black Mesa East, right before getting into the elevator with Mossman. His face texture is based on Warren Slow, who unfortunately died on July 3rd, 2006. Eli's Harvard Shirt Upon closer inspection of Eli's shirt in Half-Life 2, the Harvard University name and logo can be seen on it. His shirt changes in Episode 2 to a blue, diamond-patterned shirt. Through this shirt, Eli may be a Harvard graduate. Gabe Newell did drop out of Harvard University, and this shirt could reference his quote-unquote alma mater. Originally, Eli wore a Yale University shirt as seen in the beta textures and the E3 2004 trailer. The Crab Synth The Crab Synth is an incomplete Half-Life 2 enemy that's briefly shown on the conveyor belt during Freeman's second pod ride. 
They appear as giant bulky creatures with heavily modified weapons carried on their backs. Gamefile reveals that they could charge at their targets and fire the machine guns underneath their bodies. This enemy would never make another appearance in any of the other Half-Life games. Non-Mechanical Reproduction Simulation Throughout Half-Life 2, the Overwatch voice could say this line on the Metro Cops radio. Tank leaders, reminder, 100 sterilized credits qualifies non-mechanical reproduction simulation. This non-mechanical reproduction simulation that Overwatch refers to could be allowing civil protection to possibly either masturbate or have sex with another unit that receives this award. This award could also be a drug that simulates the pleasure of reproduction. The reproduction simulation seems to be an incentive for the civil protection to continue to carry out their duties. The Cat When Barney enters Kleiner's lab at the beginning of Half-Life 2, he references a cat when Dr. Kleiner says that they have a working teleporter again. You mean it's working? For real this time? Because I still have nightmares about that cat. No, no. This cat was the subject of an attempted teleport, and the experiment went horribly wrong to the point that Barney had become traumatized by the experience. There's an illusion of what happened to the cat. In Kleiner's lab, the player can interact with a small teleporter with a cactus on it. If the player teleports the cactus a few times, the teleporter breaks down, making the cactus disintegrate. The achievement, what cat, is earned after breaking the mini teleporter. This suggests that the cat was brutally disintegrated after the teleportation failed. On September 14th, 2019, a user on the Half-Life 2 Project beta forums posted an image of Alex's presumed cat as a repo. The cat was going to have robotic legs and could be the subject of the teleport. Prospero Prospero was one of Valve's first game designs and was supposed to come out shortly after Half-Life 1. The game was to emphasize exploration, an intricate storyline, and combat via psionic powers. As the design of Half-Life 1, known internally as Quiver at the time, started to take over some of Prospero's initial goals, Prospero evolved into a massively multiplayer game which led to the goal of mixing official and user created worlds which then could be accessed through an in-game library and each world will be running on its own server. Now we're just getting deeper and deeper and deeper. We're in the deep waters. Real Time Moss during the development of Half-Life 1, Gabe Newell wanted to make the environment more lively by having real-time moss growth appear on the walls if the player stays in a certain area for an extended amount of time. The feature was cut due to technological and time constraints. Newell also hinted at real-time moss growing being implemented in Half-Life 2, but that did not come to fruition. Is it possible that Newell's dream of moss can happen with the technological advancements of the next Half-Life game? Half-Life Alex's Zoo Zombie In the Half-Life Alex chapter, Captivity, Alex goes through antlion tunnels which led her to an abandoned Russian zoo. A headcrab zombie can be seen admiring children's drawings posted on the walls. This ties back to the point where zombies can retain some form of their consciousness. Another moment similar to this happens at the beginning of the chapter, The Quarantine Zone, where a zombie can be seen reading the subway map. Hallucination Stuff I'm not sure what this hallucination stuff is, so leave a comment if you guys know what this is about. Half-Life Alex's Alternate Timelines Now this, this one is a doozy man. <sighs> okay, so at the end of Half-Life Alex, the G-Man offers her a favor in return for her services, as he wants to replace Freeman, who failed to carry out the duties that were assigned to him. Alex asks for the Combine to be removed off of Earth, but the G-Man declines. Instead, he shows Alex the future, where Eli Vance gets killed by a Combine advisor. The G-Man allows Alex to kill the advisor and save her father. He reiterates the consequences that Alex will face after she killed the advisor, then puts her into stasis. The end credit scene shows Gordon and Eli awaken in the White Force helicopter hangar. Alex is nowhere to be seen, and Eli angrily ridicules the G-Man's consequences and states that he's going to kill him. Many fans have speculated that the ending has caused alternate timelines, one where Eli lived and one where Eli died. It's possible that right after Alex was put into stasis, she would return to the vault's ruins without memories of the G-Man or killing the advisor, and progress through the timeline to Half-Life 2. 
So this end credit scene could possibly be a brand new timeline, or maybe it's an alternate timeline, or it's, it's this timey wimey stuff, I don't know. It's honestly kind of confusing, so uh, if you guys can clarify, can, can, can you do that in the comments? Thank you. Gordon's Personal Holocaust Gordon's personal holocaust refers to a cut line from the G-Man during Half-Life 1's ending if the player refused G-Man's offer. Well, it looks like we won't be working together. No regrets, Mr. Freeman. But there are a few survivors of your personal holocaust who would like the chance to meet the man responsible for the total annihilation of their race. Gordon's personal holocaust most likely harkens to the numerous alien deaths that Freeman caused during the Black Mesa incident. Half-Life 1 reads your CD drive. When Half-Life 1 was first released in 1998, it came out on a disc. Obviously. The game was programmed to use the music tracks on the CD. When the game came out on Steam, the music files came in the game files, but will still prioritize music from any CD you put in the disc drive, assuming you have one in your PC. Not sure why it's this deep in the iceberg, but Sockman won't admit that they kept this vague to increase the creepy factor. It's all a simulation. This could be referring to the fact that uh, the Half-Life series is a series of video games? Yes, it's a simulation of some nerdy ass scientist who survives loads of violent confrontations where a random person will be decimated. Maybe it's possible that the Combine Invasion could be a simulation? Maybe the Black Mesa incident was a simulation. Maybe the whole Half-Life story is Freeman's dream. Maybe we're in a simulation. What if this video you're watching, and me creating this video, and me reading the script to this video is a simulation? Now we're past the point of no return. Now we're at the bottom. Who's playing the piano? In the vault, you can hear a piano being played in multiple areas, and sometimes it's played in reverse. You can also hear the piano right before going to Russell's lab. Now, I'm not quite sure why this entry is deep in the iceberg, because the piano could just be part of the game's soundtrack? Am I missing something here? Let me know. Fast headcrabs are normal headcrabs. During the development of Half-Life 2, fast headcrabs were developed first and were supposed to replace the original headcrab. Remnants of the idea remain in the final game as the standard headcrab model is called headcrabclassic.mdl, while the fast headcrab is just called headcrab.mdl. D1 Canals 04 and D2 Coast 06. Neither of these maps exist in the final game of Half-Life 2. The game skips from D1 Canals 03 to D1 Canals 05, and from D2 Coast 05 to D2 Coast 07. The answer is most likely that those two maps were cut out during development. It's probably an oversight in renaming the maps, and it's unknown what these missing maps could have been. They may exist in the Half-Life 2 beta leak, or they never got any major development and got cut early. Who knows? The G-Man is Valve. The G-Man's character and dialogue can be interpreted as a meta-commentary from Valve. This is the most evident when the G-Man is directly talking to Freeman, and henceforth the player. Valve and the G-Man can put Freeman in whatever world they design, and whenever the date is right for Freeman to come around. Gordon's quote-unquote Limitless Potential from Half-Life 1 represents the limitless potential that the Half-Life series has been in innovating video games. Freeman's limitless potential may have hit a limit, ironically, with the release of Half-Life Alex. Valve has opted to create a game that revolves around Alex Vance instead of Freeman. This theory could also apply to G-Man's decision to recruit Alex at the end, replacing Freeman as he was not meeting the G-Man's, or Valve's, expectations. Gordon has no free will. It is often implied throughout the games that Freeman possesses no free will. Gordon Freeman's name and the moniker, the one free man, given to him by the resistance is meant to be ironic. It's obvious that Freeman is controlled by the player, and all the Half-Life games are linearly built with only one path to go forward. The G-Man also serves as a metaphor for Freeman's lack of free will. The G-Man heavily influences what Freeman does to the point of making Freeman a puppet, 
and would follow him to keep him in check. This notion about the G-Man goes back to the previous entry where G-Man represents Valve, both to guide the player's experience at all times. This lack of free will theme is also applicable to Half-Life 1, where at the end, the player can decide whether to accept the G-Man's offer or not. The choice that the player made was ultimately irrelevant as Half-Life 2 begins assuming that Freeman chose to accept the G-Man's offer. Trains serve as a metaphor for the lack of free will. Every main entry in the Half-Life series, except for Half-Life Alex, begins with the player riding a train. Trains are linear and move along a set path, symbolizing the G-Man's strict control over Gordon's path. Squeal 1. Wave. In the Half-Life 2 beta, there is a window found in the map D1 Terminal 01. Behind it, there is a flashing room and a weird contraption making ticking sounds, almost like a clock. You can hear it make weird noises, one of them is named squeal1.wave in the game files. The only way to play the sound in the final game is in the chapter Highway 17. After the player defeats their first gunship, if they decide to kill this rebel on top of the tower, squeal1.wave could be heard. It's unknown why this sound is here, and how the rebel causes the sound to be played. Citadel Screams Many players have noted that screams can be heard throughout the Citadel. Theories have arisen about the true nature of these screams, from those noises being the true Citadel communicating with the Combine home planet, or otherworldly powers being held within the building. There is one mysterious claim, which states that these screams are a recording of the astronauts screaming during the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster, or on January 28th, 1986. The Space Shuttle exploded 73 seconds into its flight, killing all five astronauts and two payload specialists aboard. However, no such recording exists or is used in the game. The most likely answer is that these screams are from the process of making stalkers, humans who had been drastically altered through extreme synth engineering by the Combine. They become servants who mindlessly operate machinery and guard the core in the Citadel. The Resistance Can't Win Considering the sheer amount of the Combine's multi-dimensional firepower that conquered Earth in only 7 hours, it's pretty safe to assume that the Resistance alone cannot defeat the Combine without significant assistance. A Pistol 3 reflects on the Resistance's unreachable goal of liberation. As the Borealis, set for self-destruction, approaches the Combine Command Center, Freeman sees that it is protected by a Dyson Sphere, a hypothetical megastructure that completely encompasses a star, or planet in this situation, and captures a large percentage of its power output. He recognizes the ineffectiveness of their rebellion before the Vortigons teleport him back to Earth. Although Pistol 3 is considered non-canon, that does not write off the Combine's potential to construct such a thing in the future games. It's quite possible that outside forces, such as the Vortigons and possibly others, could provide the support that the Resistance needs to continue their fight against the Combine. But it's ultimately up to Valve to decide whether or not humanity has what it takes to defeat the Combine and free their home once and for all. Thank you so much for watching. If there's anything wrong in the video, please leave me any feedback and maybe I could do a follow-up video. And to my regular viewers, yeah, all seven of you, this is definitely different from what I usually do, so thanks for watching.